Côté du Nord.
You get more than sign your name. I haven't met Mr. Gorbachev. But you wrote you wrote more than your name. It has become the longest of this century. On this day, 40 years ago, they swarmed onto the boulevards of Paris, rallied under the Arc de Triomphe, and sang the Marseillaise. In the They were out there in the open and free air. And now, on this day, 40 years ago, Winston of Britain, this is your victory. And the crowd yelled back in an unforgettable moment of love and gratitude, no, it is yours. Across the ocean, a half a million New Yorkers flooded Times Square and laughed and posed for the campus. In Washington, our new president, Harry Truman, Coca, there was still a war on the Pacific front, and I realized I would never forget that moment. This day can't help but be emotional. For in it was such a different world then, it's almost impossible to describe it to someone who wasn't there. But when they finally turned the lights on in the cities again, it was like being reborn. If it is hard to communicate the happiness of those days, it is even harder to communicate to those who did not share it the depth of Europe's agony. So much of it lay in ruins. Whole cities had been destroyed. Children played in the rubble and begged for food. And by this day 40 years ago, over 40 million lay dead, and the survivors, they composed a continent of victims. And to this day we wonder, how did this happen? How did civilization take such a terrible turn? After all the books and documentaries, after all the histories and studies, we still wonder, how? Hannah Arendt spoke of the banality of evil. We know there were totalitarians who used the state which they had elevated to the level of a god to inflict war on peaceful nations and genocide on innocent peoples. We know of the existence of evil in the human heart. And we know that in Nazi Germany, that evil was institutionalized, given power and direction to the state and those who did its bidding. We also know that early attempts to placate the totalitarians did not save us from war. In fact, Schumann, Big Asbury, and Spock, Truman, and Marshall. 
If any doubt their success, let them look at you. In this room are those who fought on opposite sides 40 years ago, and their sons and daughters. Now you work together to lead Europe democratically. You buried animosity and hatred in the rubble. There is no greater testament to reconciliation and to the peaceful unity of Europe than the men and women in this chamber. And Adam Smith came from Europe. And the geniuses who ushered in the modern industrial technological age came from, well, I think you know. But two examples will suffice. Marconi, who invented the radio, thereby by providing a living for a, for a young man from Dixon, Illinois, who later went into politics. I guess I should explain. That's me, Blaine Marconi. <laughs> First in Angola in 1975, then when the West failed to respond in Ethiopia, in South Yemen, in Kampuchea, and ultimately in Afghanistan, the Soviet Union began courting more risk than expansion. Expanding its influence through the... decision-making in the earlier post-war era had taken place against a background of overwhelming American strategic power. So the decisions of the late 70s were taken in Moscow nuclear arsenal. In the short run, we have no alternative but to compete with the Soviet Union in this in this field, not in the pursuit of superiority, but merely of balance. It is thus essential that the United States maintain a modern and survivable nuclear capability in each leg of the strategic triad. <laughs> the Soviet Union, however, does not share our view of what constitutes a stable nuclear balance. It has chosen instead to build nuclear forces clearly designed to strike first and thus disarm their adversaries. The Soviets in the closest possible fashion with our allies. And when the time for decisions on the possible production and deployment of such systems comes, we must and will discuss and negotiate these issues with the Soviet Union. Both for the short and the long term, I'm confident the West can maintain effective military deterrence. But surely we can aspire to today is whether we have learned Soviet Union based upon effective deterrence and the reduction of tensions. I believe we can. I believe we've learned, learned that fruitful cooperation with the Soviet Union must be accompanied by successful competition in areas, particularly third world areas, where the Soviets are not yet prepared. <laughs> in my own country. 
Congress, some of those will walk out. <laughs> to achieve military superiority, efforts to sustain a productive dialogue with the Soviet Union. We're reminded of the obstacles posed by our so fundamentally different concepts of humanity, of human rights, of the value of human life. The murder evolve into a risk reduction mechanism for rapid communication and exchange of data in times of crisis. These proposals are not cure <coughs> for our current problems. They will not compensate for the deaths which have occurred. But as terrible as past events have been, our ideals of freedom and democracy and our economic systems have proven their ability to meet the needs of our people. Our adversaries can offer their people only economic stagnation and the corrupt hand of a state and party bureaucracy which ultimately satisfies our constancy of the American purpose. We were at your side through two great wars. We have been at your side through 40 years of a sometimes painful peace. We're at your side today because like you, we have not veered from the idea. <laughs> we do not deny any nation's legitimate interest in security. We share the basic aspirations of all of the peoples of Europe freedom, prosperity, and peace. But when families are divided and people are not allowed to maintain normal human and cultural contacts, this creates international tension. Only in a system in which all feel secure and sovereign can there be a lasting and secure peace. 